We're ready. Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Source of the Yacht Club. This is the continuation of our Wednesday night speaker series. Uh, this is a special event. This is a return event, actually. Uh, Owens Rowing is back. Um, uh, we had a brief introduction to his efforts approximately six or eight weeks ago. The topic will be his plan to row across the Atlantic in a boat that's currently um, in the parking lot here at the club. And this video will be posted on our YouTube page. But before we get to our speaker, I'd like to give a round of applause to our racers from the most recent Big Boat Rolex series uh, on San Francisco Bay. We had three contestants who um, place well. One was Chuck Shiok, our staff Commodore, who in the J-105 class, Hazard Waste was the name of his boat, um, finished 11th out of 20 some odd boats. Uh, Gary won his class, the national class of the J-88s, and he, the half model of his boat is on the wall next to us. Uh, Neil Gibbs took uh, uh, second place uh, in some ways was one, first place because he was tied with points but had one less uh, first place finish um, in his yawl. And uh, Hank Eason, uh, one of our members who's only about 88 years of age, raced his boat Yucca in the 8 meter class and did very well. Pictures are on our webpage and um, elsewhere, so please a round of applause for our racers from the Yacht Club, uh, etc. I'm going to turn it over to Owens Rowing to give a story about his efforts to row across the Atlantic and also to support a very worthy uh, cancer foundation. So, round of applause. Welcome to Owens Rowing. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, talk about our row and uh, the charity partner that we're looking to support. I thought what we'd do is go in and talk a little bit about who, what, and why and then have an opportunity for some Q&A. So a little bit about me. Um, I have lived or had lived in the Bay Area for about 30 years. And most recently we were in San Francisco and Napa split time. But then in 2017, um, life decided to throw a little curveball and my wife's company closed. Our dog died and our house burned down in the Atlas Peak fires. And so, it, kind of sent us a message that there's no certainties in life, and so we decided to take a pivot, and I retired, and we decided to pursue the row. Uh, but we ended up moving to Reno and uh, doing a house remodel, and the logistics of the move and COVID, it meant that the row is a little, 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 little later than a year later or so than I originally had hoped for. But we'll be looking at doing this row coming this December. Um, one of the other things is I'm a former South End uh, Rowing Club member, uh, but when I was at the South End Rowing Club, I wasn't an actual rower. I was a swimmer, and so I had been uh, training for some open water swims, and I had uh, actually qualified to do the Straits of Gibraltar and Anna Capita Oxnard, and four days later I had a bicycle accident that resulted in a reverse shoulder replacement. <laughs> so I uh, had to like pivot off of that as well, and so I had to pivot away from swimming because with my shoulder replacement is the one thing I can't do. Um, and then I was a, a partner at Novogratic and Company. It's a certified public accounting firm here headquartered in San Francisco and um, was there for over 26 years. And so kind of a little bit of a background on me and then kind of contexting that into the race itself. I'm actually going to be one of uh, five solo rowers uh, for this coming year's race. Um, up until about a month ago I was one of four but uh, one of the pairs team, the two rowers agreed that in order to remain friends, <laughs> that they should end up being just a solo entrant. <laughs> so, wise well, move. We we're now down to five. We're up now up to five solo rowers. Uh, one of only four American teams. There was supposed to be a fifth team, but uh, they decided because of COVID, uh, they just weren't prepared, and so they're uh, delaying their entry into the race. Um, and I am. Uh, as far as the race organizers know, I'm going to be the only uh, rower to ever do the row with an artificial shoulder. So we'll see how that goes. The what is uh, the Talishka Whiskey Atlantic Challenge? It is an organized race that happens each December, 
and you start in uh, the Canary Islands off of the island of La Gomera, and you row uh, west to the Antigua, and so it's 3,000 uh, miles, give or take, uh, depending on how straight line you go. And so I'll report to La Gomera at the end of November and undergo two weeks of safety inspections, trainings, debriefings, and then right now the tentative launch date for the race is uh, December 12th. So we're approaching close to 80 days to the start of the race. Um, you know, kind of the race organizers like to brag that they consider this the world's toughest race uh, a row. Um, I'm sure a lot of people that row to Hawaii might argue with that or row the Pacific. This year's uh, race is actually going to be kind of big. Because of COVID, a number of teams deferred their entry from last year to this year's race. So we actually have 37 teams that are going to participate in the 2021 20, row. And there's 109 rowers from 14 countries. Uh, participating this year and as one of the solos just kind of to give you kind of a context about how much time we're thinking this is going to take uh, for a solo for the past five years going back to the five years of the last races it's on average about 60 days for a solo rower and so you can look in you know in this race there's pairs trios quads this year they have one five person team and you know kind of a, a, a four-person team can do the race in under 40 days so this year when the race was about three weeks underway there was about 1400 miles between the lead boat and the last boat so it gets separated pretty quickly uh, so I, my goal is to be somewhere hopefully close to that 60 days and not too much longer than that <laughs> These are just a couple of the photos uh, uh, from some training. Um, picture on our left is me over at Ilea Cove. I have come down with one of the things we were talking about is that I'm required to do 120 hours of ocean training on the boat. And having moved to Reno during the winter, I did a lot of training up at Pyramid Lake, which you may or may not know is it's a lake that's only three miles uh, smaller than Lake Tahoe. Um, but it, it, the boat ramps are actually opened all year round where Lake Tahoe, the boat ramps are closed during the winter. So I would drive out to Pyramid Lake and do my training during the winter. And then once we started getting to springtime, I'd and kind of come over the hill, started coming down and doing my training down here at the bay. And so I did a lot of, when we went with the requirements, they take the 120 hours, 24 of those can be on lakes and rivers. The rest of it has to be ocean water, but they also require you spend at least 24 hours of nighttime rowing. And so I'd come down more up at uh, Angel Island, wait for the evening to hit, and then get back out and row around Angel Island or the bay at night and uh, do that. The picture on the right is a photo from a recent uh, row where I have gone down in, in order to get some of the true open water. And with the conditions we've had this summer being so windy, I've actually done two rows where I've gone from Santa Cruz to Monterey and then I've done two rows from Newport Beach down to San Diego and so this picture here on the right is me leaving out of uh, Newport Beach uh, starting out on a row and so I felt it was important to kind of get some time out on the true open water but also not dealing with the conditions we've been dealing with outside the bridge uh, this spring. So. I feel like I, 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 with the 120, I've got almost 200 hours of ocean rowing to date. And I, unfortunately, I would love to get more, but because of the global shipping crisis, we're actually having to ship our boats to the start line a month earlier than normal. And I actually have to get my boat to Savannah because the West Coast ports are so backlogged that they're having us go out of the East Coast ports. But I have to actually, I got shipping quotes of anywhere from five to $9,000 to have the boat transported across the country. So I will be driving the boat <laughs> across the country. <laughs> so I will be leaving, uh, even though the race starts December 12th, I will leave uh, to drive the boat to the East Coast starting on October 6th. So I really, I'm, I'm, I may be done with the actual amount of time I have to train on the boat itself. I may be able to squeak in one more row, but maybe not because I still have to pack the boat. I still have to put all my food in and all my gear and get that ready for the shipping process. So it's just amazing how fast the time goes by and uh, just a little stressful. <laughs>
So I want to talk a little bit about the why. So in 1996, my mom had gone home to Ireland to visit her family and she um, didn't feel well, went to the hospital and was diagnosed with stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and passed away shortly thereafter. And I had the opportunity to go back to Ireland and visit her in the hospital. And one of the things I noticed while we were there was that one of the blessings of her being in Ireland was that all of her siblings could come visit her, her nieces and nephews could come visit her, her parents could come visit her, but there were other patients that were in the cancer ward that didn't have family that could do that. So when I came home, I actually started volunteering at UCSS uh, Pediatric Bone Marrow Transplant Unit. And it's a similar situation with the kids. You know, parents have jobs, they've got kids, other kids they got to take care of. And so there's hours on that end where the kids are in the hospital alone, not having anybody to visit with them. So I would go every week and visit with the kids at the Pediatric Bone Marrow Transplant Unit. Through that, I learned about Okaizu. And Okaizu is an organization that helps families in Northern California and Northern Nevada that are dealing with pediatric uh, cancer. And so they run programs. Uh, they run programs for the actual children that have oncology where they do summer camp for them. And they have uh, full nursing and doctor support. And they go are able to be taken care of while they're at the camp. And then they also are one of only a handful of uh, camps in the country that actually offer programs specifically for the siblings of the kids with cancer. And so they offer sessions dedicated just to them because, you know, the siblings of the kids with cancer are having their own kind of issues of not getting the attention of the parents, not, you know, not wanting to be a burden because the, their brother or sister is having, you know, is ill. So they also do teen programs for the older kids. They do bereavement camp and they do family camp where they bring the parents in with the kids, volunteers help the kids with activities, and the parents get to go through and actually, you know, meet with other parents, meet with doctors, and have peer-to-peer -peer support, be able to talk about what they're doing and share stories. But one of the most amazing things about Camp Kaizu is they don't charge anything for their programs. So everything that they do is free. And so we've been involved with them for over 20 years. I was a summer camp counselor for two summers there. My wife and I have been uh, camp counselors at, uh, for family camp. And I just think it's just an amazing program. And so we decided that when we are going to do the row, that part of what we were trying to do was raise money for them. Little did we know at the time that we uh, selected them to be our charity partner and started working with them. Last fall, in the Berry Creek fires, they lost their camp. The camp burned down, and it was a camp that they had got 20 years ago, and they just paid off the mortgage on the camp. And now it's just been devastated from the fires and they're in the process of um, going through a cleanup of the property. They've had the environmental cleanup done and now they're doing the debris removal. And so now they're looking at studying uh, the rebuild process. And so if there was ever a time that they could use fundraising, it's even more important now than it was before. So, you know, I encourage you to consider a look at Kaizu and uh, think about whether that's an organization you might want to support. And we you can go onto our website uh, owensrowing.com and there's a donate button there and it connects you right. All of our money that we're doing, we're covering the cost of the row. So every dollar that we raise is going directly to Okaizu. So none of the money that we're raising is going to any of the expenses of the uh, boat, my food or any of that stuff. So hopefully you'll consider that. So with that, we kind of open it up for any kind of questions about the row because um, I know there's sometimes some details that people like to try to understand. Um, if you get an opportunity to see the boat, it gives you, it's hard to look at the photos. It doesn't look quite the same as seeing it in person and actually trying to visualize what that's going to be like to be on there for 60 days. Well, my first question is, as I understand the currents, and this is what, you know, sailors have done for centuries, uh, the current's going to push you south. And so, you know, you're going to go from basically the Canary, how current pushes you from the Canaries down to the Azores, Azores of the Canaries, rather. How do you compensate for that? How do you make sure you're heading in the right direction? 
So the question was, is that the, um, Tom was bringing up that the currents uh, tend to run south, uh, and how am I going to compensate that for that? And actually, that that's one of the actual first parts of the races. That's what everybody's doing. The race is in December, and they do it in December in part because hopefully it's after hurricane season, and hopefully your prevailing winds and currents have started blowing. And so at the beginning of the race, there's a whole strategy. If you go from the Canary Islands to Antigua in a straight line, it's the shortest distance. But there, as you're saying, there is a strategy where some people will actually try to go south and catch the prevailing current faster. And even though they row longer, they might have a faster row. Um, we've talked about this on our, our calls with the race organizers, and they said it's it's been a crapshoot. They've had you know many years where the straight line has been the fastest way. Many years where it's the longer routes been, and so last year what happened was a number of teams went for the straight route, and some of the four-person boats that were faster, stronger, actually got a fast time. Some of the solos and pairs that weren't as strong ended up spending at least another week or more um, delayed from if they had gone south because they ended up sitting on their pair of anchors not moving. Uh, because they couldn't fight the conditions that they were dealing with. And so that's going to be the fun part at the beginning of the race is trying to figure out where you think that current is and how do you think you're going to catch it. And it, it can have a dramatic impact on your, your crossing time. Sure. Quick question. How are you planning to manage your sleep? And how do you practice for that? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So, uh, um, if you if on the teams, the pairs, the trios, and the quads, they pretty much have a universal approach on how they manage their sleep and rotations. And pretty universally, there are two hour on, two hour off uh, rotation. For the solos, I've talked to a number of rowers from the past, and it's been dramatically varied on what previous solo rowers have done. Some people will do the two hours on and two hours off. The gentleman that I bought my boat from, he actually rode as much as he could during the day, and then he slept almost all night. Um, I found, I've done, so the last row I did was 40 hours, and then I did a row before that that was um, th three, four hours. And so on those rows, I've been practicing, and I find I like a three hour on, an hour off, and rotate that through the day, and then at night, I'll take one three hour break. And that seems to work pretty well. And so once I actually do that for more than a few days, a couple of days, it'll be interesting to see if that pattern sticks. Because <laughs> yeah, this last row, um, when I went, I, I rode from Newport Beach to, to San Diego last week. And as I came out of Newport Beach, the wind and the swell was coming from the south. And I was heading into it. And, you know, I just I, I mismanaged my whole day. I stayed on the oars too long, I didn't take breaks, I didn't eat right, I didn't hydrate properly, and by about five in the morning, I was just toast. And so I took a two and a half hour nap, got up, made oatmeal, had a cup of coffee, filled all my bottles up, cleaned up my uh, de rowing deck, and then got back on the oars and recovered. But I just, I, it made me realize how important that's gonna be even though you want to like sit on the oars and you think you got to make the time, this event's so long that I, I, the rest part of it is just as important as the rowing time part. Mm -hmm. What kind of technology do you have on your board that like life savers in terms of survival? Yeah, so so it's, uh, kind of technology for survival and you know kind of emergencies, we're pretty well uh, equipped. So I have an EPER. That's uh, an emergency position radio indicator beacon, I think is the acronym. And so it's mounted on the bulkhead so that, you know, if you've uh, got a capsize, it'll uh, release and set off a radio distress signal. Um, I'll have a personal locator beacon on my uh, safety harness. So when I'm on deck, at all times, I'm required to have a safety harness on and be clipped into two points on the boat. And that safety harness has my personal locator beacon. I have a, a life raft, and in the grab bag for the life raft, I have a second uh, EPIRB, and then I've got two satellite phones, 
We've got a VHF radio. I've got a handheld VHF radio. I've got a handheld GPS. Um, we have on the on the boat. I have AIS, so it'll tell me that if any uh, ships are coming, and it'll send off an alarm if that comes. So you know we're pretty dialed in. And during the race, uh, every two days, we're required to check in at a given time with the safety team, and they'll provide me with a weather update and then they'll check in to see how everything's going. So it's one of the things about this race is it's, even though it's an unassisted race, there's a lot of like support, like not only in the requirements of what you have to do to be qualified to show up to the start line, but then during the race, you know, they're checking in on you and making sure that they know where you're at. They, they know they have a, a, a device that they put on there that live tracks you at all times. So then they'll know exactly where I'm at at all times, and then they check in every two days just to see how you're doing. Well, on the point of survival, uh, I'm a rower, nothing like you're doing. But I find when I row in my skull or in a, in a white hall, at about three hours, even with pads, my butt is sore. <laughs> I mean, so that I kid you not, I develop a pseudo sciatica. Yeah. I'm not tired rowing. I uh, uh, muscularized, uh, cardiovascularized, but my behind just hurts. Yeah. How do you, how do you do that? Yeah. So, so the question was uh, talking about uh, yeah. taking care of your uh, backside yeah. while you're rowing. Yeah. And so I have, um, I've, I've got my, you know, the basic seat, and I'll, I'll start off on that when I do my rows, and then, like you're saying, at a certain point, it gets uncomfortable, and then I have pads that go on top of the seat, and it just kind of shifts your position, gives you a little different cushioning, and that you alternate back and forth between that. And then the other thing I've done is uh, I've taken like uh, the foam sleeping pads for backpacking, sure. and I've cut that up, and I've created a block of about six layers and glued it together, and so, having that as kind of if I get in kind of some physical distress on the backside, then I can cut open holes or, you know, shape it so that I can create some relief points. Yeah. And they had, a, they had a guy that this year who um, he was in the row and he ended up being the last guy to finish, but he had infections on the backside yeah. and in the front side. And they, that's what he literally had to do. He had to literally take the foam pads and cut holes in it, so that was the only way he could sit uh, during the row. Um, so hopefully, I don't get into that situation because oh, is, my my behind's hurting just talking about it. I mean, I just, I mean, it just, I don't know. I was sympathy paid for you. Yeah, um, it, it used to be, you know, uh, there was there was a period of time in ocean rowing where everybody uh, would brag about or talk about like rowing naked. Yeah. Exactly. And um, they've kind of uh, pivoted from that. And so they no longer suggest rowing naked. What they really recommend is that every time you come off your row shift, then you, we have baby wipes and just dry, wipe, clean everything and get it air. And then so that when you get back on the station that it's had a, uh, an opportunity to breathe. And that minimizes, they said, like kind of issues for becoming infected or, you know, chafing. So, so far, knock on wood, I haven't had any issues. <laughs> do, you, do you wear padded pants? I do not wear padded pants. Yeah. God bless you. How do you do that? <laughs> it's, uh, it actually just, you know, kind of, you know, like, like on a bike, you know, if you're wearing padded pants, it's, you know, they're pretty constricted. And so, yeah, you know, like a little, a little more airflow. Maybe there is yeah. a yeah. new uh, pattern to be made for yeah. followers. You know, oh yeah, no, this is a big issue because there's like a company in Europe that like they go there, and if you want to spend the money, they will take a mold of your backside <laughs> and make a seat based on your custom-made uh, custom mold. Really? Yeah. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I want to talk to those people. Are you kidding me? I mean, you don't know how many times I've said to myself, I'm going to get into a different sport. My bike nuts killing me. Yeah. I would love to know who those people are. I mean, how many wars do you take? How many sets of wars? Uh, so on a set of wars, we're required to take uh, uh, my main set plus a backup pair. And, but one of the issues that we 
So I, I had to go through a pre-race inspection. Yeah. And so they do a zoom inspection. We have a 13-page list of mandatory equipment. And so the race organizers, they do a pre-inspection with everybody before they can ship the boat, and they identify what you have and don't have and what you, know, you still need to get before the race starts. And so one of these we were talking about through the race inspection was, I have my I have the two sets of oars that I'm required to have. I have one set that's actually never been rowed with, but the race organizer will not consider those to be new oars because they already crossed the ocean as the backup pair for the previous rower. So one of the things I have to do is I have to buy a new pair. I have to buy a new pair of oars, and so I'm having those delivered to the start line uh, because they won't consider they. They look at it and say, you got salt water on them, you had UV elements on them during our previous crossing, and so they're not willing to take those as new. And you're rolling Makins or hatchets? Uh, uh, it's actually a random car. Boat Builder actually uh, um, has their own oar sets. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the other, and the other one that a lot of people are, are using are croakers. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. And. You know, I think they're like nine, almost nine feet long um, from tip to tip. Yeah. So, and, and and the boat with you and food of aboard, you have to start in line. Yeah. What what does the boat weigh when you take off? Yeah. So the boat the boat is expected to weigh, um, not counting me, but the boat and the food and the gear is going to be right about two thousand pounds uh, fully loaded. So. Uh, one of the things we're doing right now is in preparation for transporting it, I'm required to take 6,400, based on my body weight, I've got to take about 6,400 calories a day for 85 days. And, but they actually, like everything, they get way detailed. And I had to identify how many main meals I'm going to have. So I'm doing four main meals, and that's about 2,000 calories. So I have to take 4,500 calories of snacks. And so one of the things we've been doing do that. is we, we bought like, you know, five pound, five pound uh, jugs of muscle milk protein powder. And my wife's been taking two scoops out of it at a time, putting it in a Ziploc bag so that then, you know, we can end up making 85 snack bags and uh, setting up each day's rations uh, for, for storage. And so like, you know, we're going, we're, we're going tomorrow, Sports Basement is actually uh, generously going to uh, help us with a volume discount on some of our food. And so I'm, gonna, I'm going over tomorrow to Sports Basement and buying 275 freeze-dried meals, 275 uh, like energy bars, uh, I can't, I forget how many like packages of uh, electrolyte tablets and other snacks. What else so. is your snack bag? Oh, I got like Snickers, uh, Payday Bars, good, uh, good, beef yeah. jerky, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, uh, the oatmeal uh, pies. <laughs> uh, no cheese, because uh, it's you know it, it, it might, but it's like those compartments. Um, even though they're supposed to stay dry, they're the center com center uh, apartment has uh, wet compartments, and so. I always get moisture in there, even if it's not like standing water. It definitely has moisture in there at all times. But chocolate croissants, uh, <laughs> we're, we're those. like from uh, we, we, I, that's one of the things. Like if you go to Costco, you get those little mini chocolate croissants that are individually wrapped, and surprisingly, they have, they, stay I stay, well. they stay well. They haven't been molded at all. So yeah. So. Where, where does the word the name Okizu come from? So, uh, Hokaizu is, a, is, I think it's a Sioux uh, word, and um, I don't actually, uh, gosh. I think it's French, actually. Is it friendship? No, it sounds yeah, Japanese it's, to me. It's Sioux, it, it's, it's Sioux Indian, Amer you know, Native American. Uh, so, French Polynesian? No, no, United States, like Native Americans, uh, the, the Sioux Nation. Um, does it say on it? Yeah. I think it might be. I know it's a Sioux Indian word, yeah. and I forget. I thought it was French or. I, I'm, I'm I should know that. <laughs> I'm it's on that. First page of their website. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's a. Go ahead, go ahead, please, please. Yeah. Um, when it comes to being at sea for 60 or so days by yourself, what do you do to occupy your mind? Is it music? Is it reruns? 
Is it podcasts? What do you do to stay sharp? Uh, yeah, so for me personally, it's been uh, music. And so um, I, ca I can't tell you how hard the road gets when I have, I have you know, either my battery, I didn't manage my phone and get the, to keep it charged, or, um, you know, for one reason or another, I turn off the music. Uh, so music is, I'm, I've always got music going. I haven't done podcasts. I don't, I, I don't do well with podcasts, just like listening to them. Mm -hmm. We've we've talked about whether or not I uh, might do one of those uh, language court uh, programs. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, well. so uh, we're, yeah, we're just, but it's also like I don't know. I'm I'm very good about just like being into in the row itself, like you know, and, you know how the conditions go, and like. In the light. It'll be interesting when I'm out completely where you know there's nothing to do to look at, nothing to really think about other than just point the boat and go. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it's one of the things we're going to do is uh, my music list on my phone isn't adequate for the amount of time I'm going to spend. <laughs> so one of the things we're planning on, do, you know, it's like I get the, I can only listen to the same album so many times uh, in a row. And so we're going to be sending out an email uh, on one of our uh, social media posts coming up after the boat goes away, asking people to send their favorite album for us to, uh, so we will download it and I can have there. So we'll get a little variety of music on our uh, on our phone. Yeah. What are you What are your music choices? What would you prefer? Oh, I'm all over the map. So yeah, so I, I've got everything on there from you know like '80s music to country music, you know. Johnny Cash to you know, I got we got Janis Joplin like, you know, so it's a, and, and that's it. that's why we want like we're gonna ask people to send us because that actually what helps is to have that variety sure. and, and so that it's not so yeah. Randy Newman sail away <laughs> there you go yeah so and, and it's one of the best albums yeah. yeah well we have a couple of bagpipers here we can send us <laughs> That may make his lot of jump in the water. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. As a kid growing up, my family is Irish, and so my, my parents would play back music. I don't need to hear that. No, you've heard enough. I've heard enough. <laughs> now, you're going to be at sea at Christmas time. Yep. New Year's. Christmas and New Year's, yep. Uh, do you sell so with Hanukkah and we just sell with Christmas and New Year's? Yeah, no. Uh, I haven't, I haven't like processed that part yet. Yeah. Like, um, so a lot of people, some people will like, you know, bring Christmas lights and yeah. put it up for Christmas, or you know, Santa hats or some outfit. Uh, some people will bring, uh, you know, some booze, and then on Christmas or New Year's they'll have a little like toast. I'll say it ain't so. Say it ain't so, yeah. <laughs> Please. But I, I've decided I don't think that's going to work for me because that just seems like torture, right? Like, it's like you get one, you know, you get a little split of uh, champagne and then it's like you're back to it. I think I just, uh, I'm gonna go, I think I'm going to go cold for the rope. <laughs> yeah. And um, when you finish, not if you finish, when you finish, then what? I mean, what, what happens to the boat? <laughs> you know, well, the, the, I'll deal with the logistics then, what yeah. the psychological yeah. next uh, chapter, then what hasn't been, uh, we're figuring that out later. Um, so my plan is my boat's going to actually be shipped back to England, and the, built, the boat builder, <laughs> one of the services they offer is they help broker the boats. Yeah. And so, hopefully, uh, a rower from a future row will, um, you know, purchase the boat. Well, some of the American, one of the other American teams, kind of interesting. They actually have somebody who's going to row their boat from Antigua to Florida, and that's how they're going to get their boat back. But then they are consciously not having their boat go to the UK for sale. They're keeping it here because. They're seeing more people, more American teams trying yes. to participate. They're also seeing with the Great Pacific Race. Yeah. Our boats are one of the eligible uh, boat styles for the Great Pacific Race. So they're kind of hoping that they can find an American buyer uh, for their boat. So, and uh, the, the cost of the boat is seven to 80000 uh, So I bought my boat used from a gentleman who had done a, a one ocean crossing with it. It was a one-year-old when I got it. And it was 50,000 50, euros for the boat 
and another 10,000 euros for the gear. And so if you were to do a new a new boat build, you, it's easily 100 uh, for the boat. And that's not more. And then you got to buy all the gear and outfit it. So, you know, kind of with the resale, you know, I think that's kind of a big part of this is that, you know, it, you know if the Great Pacific Race allows solo entrance, I might be uh, tempted to bring the boat back and, uh, you know, try to participate in that. But uh, I, I still am not, I don't know that I can fit on, I can do something like that with somebody else on a 24 foot boat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you have solar panels, and, what, and how much how much power do you generate within a 24 hour? How much power do you need? I should ask. You yeah. So in a normal sunny day, I can act, I can keep the I can keep my I've got two batteries and I can keep those fully charged uh, on a sunny day. Even on a you know kind of a partly cloudy overcast day, I can keep the batteries charged. And when I say charged, that lets me go through the night running my Navigation equipment, my AAS, my radio, um, keeping my USB going to keep my phone charged, uh, and and what I typically do for uh, for power management is the water maker gets run at midday when you've got most sunlight and you're assured that you actually do have sunlight, and then I run I run the water maker fill up. The, uh, I got two uh, five gallon uh, jugs that I fill up each day and then I can ensure that I've got water, and then um, that gives them enough, gives the batteries enough time to top back off before night hits. Is it a water It's a, a desalination unit. So we're actually taking you know, the ocean water, running through the desalination, and then get a bottle of water, and I have a backup hand pump one, and I've used the backup hand pump just to make sure that it works and that I can do it. And I just pray I never have to use it because it's so slow <laughs> and so much work. Okay, I, I have some very bad news to tell you. It just came out the Marin County Board of Supervisors passed a resolution. You cannot go on this race. Okay. Because you have desalinization. <laughs> Marin County has none of that. So yeah. even though you can generate five gallons a day, yeah. I mean, you know the, the debate right now yeah. Marin County yeah, yeah. about desaling. Yeah. 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 I saw, I saw that. So you produce was it ten gallons a day or five gallons? A day? I, I have two five. I have two five gallon uh, containers yes. that I keep topped off uh, right. each day. Right. Yeah. So that way, if I do get into a situation where I, I you know, get bad weather for extended periods of time, at least I've got the water already made. Sure. And then I don't have to worry about that. Yeah. And then one of the things we've been doing is like you know not only for not power management, but you know, when you're on the boat, I'm doing four meals a day that are dehydrated meals that are like backpack freeze dried meals. And so I've got a jet boil that I can heat up water and, and you know, do hot meals. But sitting on that boat, rocking, taking the time to dig all that stuff out, I've been, one of the things I've been doing during my practice rows is actually eating those cold. And uh, a lot of people have do that apparently during the row, so that way you don't have to mess around with you know, the, jet, you know, the, the stove during the row. And uh, it's an acquired taste. <laughs> How's the stove powered? A uh, little uh, propane. Uh, so propane. Yeah, exactly. So you have to take four. I think I'm going to take uh, four propane canisters. I'm required to take just based on the race organizer's requirements. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I'm thinking that I'm probably going to only do my breakfast meals hot, and then maybe my other meals will be cold. And uh, <laughs> it, it's just, uh, it's just, you know, the last thing you want to do is like, you know, have that uh, either the hot water that you're boiling or the the burner turn over while you're That's right. cooking. So <coughs> it's just a safety issue and time issue. Mm -hmm. And what happens if you get sick? You get uh, you know, of influenza. You run a temperature. Uh, and, and you I think get, you, somebody contracts COVID. You know yeah. what? What then? Is, is there is there a, an emergency health backup? Well, yeah. Emergency? So uh, as we're saying, so even though it's an unassisted row, like right. I can't right. take any gear on, I do have access to the race organizers uh, team. 
And so in addition to the safety team, there's a, there's a race medical doctor. And so I can be in touch with him if there anything comes up. And if it gets to the point where you physically are unable to continue, then you can put it out for, uh, you know, kind of distress um, protocols. And so that that could be depending on this, you know the severity and the urgency. That could be that you know any ship in the area gets diverted to do a rescue, or uh, the race organizers have two safety yachts that go out during during the course of the race. So what they do is after about two weeks, they'll launch the first yacht that will sail from the Canary Islands to Antigua and it'll go up through the race. And once it gets to the front boat, it'll go on and, uh, and, and park off of Antigua. And then a few weeks later, the second boat will leave and do the same thing. So I will see a support boat probably once or twice during the course of the race. And so they're not going to be generally like within a day or two of helping you, but they're you know kind of out there. And then if something happens, they can get there. Like this last year, um, there was a, there were two marlin strikes within a 24-hour period of time, and so two boats had their hulls pierced by marlin bills, and the support yacht happened to be like within a day's journey to one of the boats that had had um, you know gotten struck just by coincidence. So they were able to go in and check in on them after they had done their repair work to make sure everything was okay. And so, yeah. That's, I, I, I've talked with other rowers, uh, Leah Ditton in particular, yeah. the English uh, rower. Um, do you plan to clean the bottom when you're underway, or just let it grow, whatever grows? Yeah, no, uh, hull maintenance is an important part of the road. Yeah. So um, it, we're going so slow um, that um, stuff is going to grow, and so the, the, it's recommended every seven to ten days. We'll have to get in the water and uh, we've got a scraper and scrape the hull of the boat. And from talking to previous rowers, I can add a knot or be a knot difference in the speed, which is huge on a for a rowing boat. Yeah, so, but one of the things I've had to do during my training rows for that reason, as well as just, you know, if you get thrown off, is practice getting back on yeah. the boat from the yeah. water. So I've, had to, I've done that a uh, number of times. And it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to necessarily do, but it goes with the territory. Do you wear a wetsuit? No, 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 the water's not going to be really cold enough for that. And, yeah, it, especially the closer you get to the Caribbean, the sure. water's going to be warmer. So, no, no wetsuit. Did you wear a wetsuit? <laughs> <laughs> but you'll, you'll be tethered, right? Yeah, so as we were saying, I'm required, anytime I'm on deck, I have to be tethered and right. uh, harnessed in. And same thing, when I go in the water, I have to be tethered to the boat while I'm in the water. And uh, trust me, like I'm, even just being out in the bay in the water with the boat, it's like I, I, you want to be tethered to the boat. <laughs> it's like, you, uh, at least I would. So, well, I'm an electrical engineer, so I, I appreciate the sun requirement for your solar. How, how sunny is it? On the route, and and I ask that because is there any kind of bimini? So I'm looking at the boat. Yeah. What kind of sun protection do you have when you're out there? So it depends on. Yeah. So so the, on the sun part, uh, I mean, I think it, it's going to obviously vary. There will be periods of time where we'll get foul weather, and so you won't have sun. Yeah. But so I'm okay on that on the yeah. electrical part. I was asking about when it is sunny. Yeah, so there, there, kind of protect, cause I didn't see it. There, there's no, there's no, it looked pretty exposed. Out it's there. totally exposed. So, and, wow. and, and you can't have like a canopy over you. You, you can't, cannot. Put a, you can't put an umbrella or a sunshade right. up at yeah. all. So it, it has to be all clothing or sunscreen. So I've been, uh, rowing, I'm rowing with like those long sleeve, uh, sun, you know, SPA 50 shirts. And then we're required to have sun hats. And when I, I just did that Newport to uh, San Diego row, and I left my sun hat at home, and oh, I was so cranky. It was like, I, oh. those sun hats work yeah. so well oh. and provide so much protection. But that's what it's going to be. It's going to. But be. it's an issue. I mean, it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a. Yeah, well, we're, 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 it's one of our mandatory items is uh, sunscreen as well as all this. The, they require the sun hat and the clothing. Yeah, and it, it's like you, last year, 
there were periods of time, especially as they were getting closer to Antigua, where people were just talking about how miserable it was. It was so hot and sunny, and there yeah. was no wind, and it's just like they were just baking. So, and what, one of these, the other part that we're, we're, I'm going to do is talking to previous rowers, like when they've had those conditions, that that back compartment get where you're sleeping and taking your rest breaks gets so stifling hot right. and you have to have the head the race work it's a requirement to have the hatch door closed at all times so if you're in there there's like a little airflow and uh, people have been putting on like those um, like this is so well i've got i've got a i've got a fan that runs off my usb for airflow but then i'm also putting on the door on the hatch um, that kind of reflective thermal um, silver like uh, blankets and so that way it helps I've heard from other rowers that it really helps with dissipate some of the heat into that cabin and so because that sun in the direction we're rowing will go mm -hmm. and be right on that hatch door on the uh, rear compartment and just really like heat it up in there so you must be drinking a lot of water when you're doing this yeah no uh, water uh, yeah. Uh, hydration is a huge part of it so i uh, like on my rowing beside my rowing station i've always got uh, a water bottle with plain water and one with electrolytes in it and then i just continually have this uh, going uh, yeah because as soon as you stop drinking fluids you stop uh, sweating and then it just, it just gets miserable right. <laughs> Where's the head? <laughs> Again, I'm looking at the boat. The boat's fantastic. Yeah. I couldn't see all the way in. Yeah, so uh, we did an event yesterday uh, down in the Presidio, and we had we had to leave the boat out in the parking lot while we went to dinner. And I took everything out of the boat, given the rise of the break-in crime in the city. So uh, basically, it's a five it's a five-gallon bucket. It's, it's aft. It's in that. Uh, no, no, it's just a portable, uh, like, you know, like those orange Home Depot buckets? Yeah, it's, it's like that, but, yeah, I, yeah, like, like, yeah, like but I've got that. It's that with a toilet seat on it. And, uh, yeah, so that, and you know, and you just, uh, it, it's an experience. It's like, uh, man, I wish I had a, a long, I need an elongated uh, seat because, like, when you're trying to balance and take care of business and the, shit, and the boat's rocking, <laughs> I guess. You're holding on. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, you know, the funny, well, I don't know, I find it funny, but uh, we were talking with, uh, we were having our, we have monthly uh, Zoom calls with the safety team, and one of the guys that's on the safety team had done the row before as part of a four person boat, and they had the rotation crews, and he said, like, every, he was pretty regular with his uh, routine from that. But he was always, you're always on deck with somebody else. And so he had the same guy there every day when he was taking care of business. And he said when he got home after the row, he'd go into the bathroom and he couldn't go because he <laughs> wasn't there. Nobody was, <laughs> Nobody was <laughs> watching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, I have to ask the question. What are you going to do when he's away? I mean, if he's... Uh, well, I'm hoping that I'll be able to be at the start line and the finish line okay. for our travel restrictions. Um, and we have a small puppy, and I am in charge of media, so I will probably be, and I have a ski pass, and we live in right now. So I'm hoping to get some skiing in and the support team, and just kind of, I mean, I wish I could go trips around the world for two months, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm kind of land crew. Um, fortunately, I don't have to drive the trailer around for so this. That's been my, you know, when you drop the him off in Newport Beach and I have to turn him down to San Diego to pick him up. But no, it's um, just kind of life as usual for me. I'm um, looking forward to getting the 85 snack bags made. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, the logistics have been. Well, what are the, what are the rules of the race organizers? They won't let Marianne show up to the finish line until they call her, um, oh. and so they'll they'll be tracking my arrival, and they'll be estimating when they think the window will be, and then they'll notify her when she can actually book her for tickets to fly into the finish line, and they do that because they've had problems in the past where families have shown up, 
and had their return tickets and had to fly home before their rower finished oh, yeah. because you know some people get, think that they're going to set the world record or you know do a really fast time and then obviously the ocean doesn't allow that and so rather than having to deal with that with families they they've got a rule where you can't your family can't show up until they notify them do you have a beacon? I mean, can she or anybody, any of us, track you in real time? Yeah. So dur during during the uh, actual during during the race, um, the race organizer, all the boats will be equipped with a beacon, right. and you'll be able to go in and see every rower. You'll be able to see the course that they have taken, where they were at, the speed they're going, and it, it gets updated, you know, every few hours, and yeah. so uh, it's it's pretty real time, and uh, you, and you can kind of kind of you know. It'll show you distance to finish, distance covered, everything. So it's pretty slick, and, and that's the one thing that they said. Uh, even though it's an unassisted row, if their beacon stops transmitting, they will send the support yacht out and put in a new beacon on the boat so that they can uh, oh. be able to monitor where you're at. Gotcha. Yeah. You know. And that's all. That's on the website. That's it, it'll, it, it, so we'll have a link from my website to uh, the race organizer's website. Um, where they have they have a third party vendor that actually has a program that uh, monitor or administers it all. And the social media um, followings during the race are really good. Like um, on Facebook and Instagram, a couple days before they expect the rower to come in, they can say you can watch them come in live. Um, and we had a good time last year watching you know, everyone come in and seeing the smiles on their faces. Um, but but. The website, the Talos for Whiskey website, is fantastic. Just yeah. Yeah. better than our little <laughs> home <laughs> grown the Talos site. The Talos here is the website. So I, got, I came a little late, but this is the Atlantic. Is there a comparable Pacific? Yeah, there's so there, uh, there's a race that goes every year. I think it's every year, or every every, every other year, year. Every, every other year. year, and I think it's happened like four times. Um, this was his fourth, I think, running this year. It's called the Great Pacific Race. Yeah. It used to go from Monterey to uh, Hawaii, and uh, now it goes from Sausalito to Hawaii. Um, there's the difference. The only kind of real difference on that is uh, it's almost the same distance. It's 3,000 miles. Uh, it, in, in my mind, it's a much harder race because trying to get off of the coast of California yeah. is super challenging, and because of that. The Great Pacific Race doesn't allow solo entrance, so you have to be a, a pair or a quad team uh, to participate, which is kind of one of the reasons that I'm going and trying to do the Atlantic as opposed to doing the Pacific. Um, hopefully, I, I would, it'd be nice if that, if that ever changed. I, I would be thinking about keeping my boat. <laughs> well, on that point. Um, Russell, I, and others went out on my boat to escort the Great Pacific Race out of Memorial Day. But the winning boat, uh, which was uh, a foursome, all male, um, about a 235. Yes. Yeah. That boat right now is back in Sausalito. It's in dry storage at Schoonmaker. And if you go to the Harbor Master's office at Schoonmaker, it's in a trailer in dry storage. And, and so, and that, and that team, um, so that's kind of one of their, there's like, some teams that I, I don't know if I want to call them like syndicates, but they, they, they basically, they have the boat and they keep the team name going and different members participate in different events. So they've actually done the, um, the Atlanta Challenge, which I'm doing. They did that in 20, 20, was it 2020? 20, 20, 20, in 2020, they did the Atlantic Challenge and then came and did the Great Pacific Race. And it's the same team, but I think it was different members uh, participated in the row. They're pretty much a similar boat. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I have a, my boat's actually a pairs boat, so it's uh, set up, it can be either rowed by a solo or by a pair, yeah, and it's so 24. The, the, the two yeah, and so it's 24 feet long, but they make the, something very similar to that for a four-person team, and it's a, maybe a few extra feet longer, so I think it's like 27 feet or so. But it looks very similar. The part, the sleeping compartments are a little bigger, just to, you know, because you got, you might have two guys in there at a time. And where in England is it? Are they built? Uh, if the, the boat manufacturer is called Ranoke, 
and they're on uh, Burnham on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, it's um, kind of southeast uh, England. Um, it's just a small little town um, is where they're located. And well, it's, 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 it's one of the things, like, this race is very European-centric, and so it, it's uh, sometimes frustrating as an American to watch, like, you know, the English teams and the European teams, they go and ran out colds. They held a training camp a week ago where you could go and they brought in speakers from, like, the water maker, uh, nutrition, and they did training camps. They went out and helped people perfect, you know, work on rowing techniques, sea drills. And for the four American teams, like, with COVID and quarantine and, like, the expense to travel, none of us could go and participate in that. It was, you know, but the good part of that, though, is, is that we've started having uh, monthly calls among the American teams, trying to create kind of a little American kind of knowledge base and camaraderie and working together and sharing tips amongst ourselves. It's a great effort. Just out of curiosity, I, I don't know a whole lot about this, but when it's really rough seas, you have to hunker down inside yeah. and just wait it out? So in, in really foul weather, yeah, that, that's what I'll end up doing is um, I have a big para anchor, which is basically the parachute, and I'll put, I'll deploy that, and that'll minimize, you know, kind of any backward drift. Okay. Um, I also have, uh, and I'm not sure my pronunciation is going to be right, but I have a druge. And I can put the druge off the uh, tail end. Those are basically like almost like wind socks. Mm -hmm. And so when you're getting, you know, kind of wind on beam, it can kind of help stabilize the boat. I was uh, curious about that. Cause yeah. Really getting tossed about, I would guess. Oh yeah, <laughs> no, I, rough. I, I I haven't had anything super rough, but I've had the pleasure of being down here a lot of afternoons, and you know everything has yeah. been on the beam, and so. I've gotten really good <laughs> with that, and I, you know, I, I went um, a few weeks ago and I rode from Santa Cruz to Monterey, and I literally had almost like 20 miles uh, on the beam, and uh, you know I've been doing intentionally doing part of my time manually steering, and part of the time using my auto helm. So, and part of that is because the auto helms, you know, you you put a, you can I've got multiple uh, auto helms. But they have to be rotated every four or five hours, otherwise they get cranky, overtired, overheat, and so it's one of those devices. That it's really nice to have it, but there's no assurance that you won't. Like a lot of the teams will so have those where they cra the really crap out and where they just die on them during the row. Wow. And so I wanted to make sure um, I knew how to manually yeah, steer. So and when I first started rowing the boat for the first couple of months, I never used an auto helm and did all manual steering. Wow. So, um, but, it, you know, the auto helm is a very nice feature. <laughs> wow. Yeah. How much time do you focus on navigation versus raw power? So that, that's the one that uh, I'm still struggling with is on how much time I was spent on navigation. Because, you know, when you're rowing here, like, or like when I've been doing kind of the longer rows, you know, I use Navionics, and I've got that going, and I've got my course, and I'm checking where I'm at because, you know, you, you need to know where you're going. On the row, what, what I've been told is that you really only uh, check your navigation twice, once to twice a day. Yeah. And because of the distance that you're covering, even if you go off your planned bearing for the day, that it isn't that big of a deal that the next day when you set your new bearing, and you true up that it really doesn't impact kind of any material way. But it's a system, it's an autopilot, you've got an autopilot. Yeah, so what I'll have program and just exactly so concentrate on the rowing. Yeah, so I, I I'll you know I have my GPS and uh, my on my Garmin and so I'll be able to sit, you know first you know first part of the row and the end of the last part of the row I have my waypoints that I'll be uh, navigating to once I get out to the main part of the ocean it's just a straight line across. And then you know you, you pick the bearing that you need to be going for that direction, and then on my auto helm, I can set that bearing, and then it, it'll keep the you know adjusting the rudder to stay on that bearing. Right. 
and that, that's what I'm saying. That, that that device that adjusts that rudder, I got to rotate that out. I got to uh, switch it out every four or five hours. Do you have any weather routing software that you're going to be using to try to take advantage of any of those little weather anomalies? I, I, I thought I had somebody that was going to help me with my weather routing, um, but that doesn't look to be the case. And there's a big uh, debate about that uh, within the race. The safety team has said they've been doing a study on the use of weather routers and their study so far is showing zero correlation between using the weather router and an improved time. Uh, so uh, they feel that with the information they give us that there's no real need for a, a third party weather router. And um, so I'm going in without one. Uh, you know, I've got Wendy, but you know, I, I, that's <laughs> you know, he's windy, you know, <laughs> not to trust it. Uh, not very grand. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, so I, I am, uh, at this point, I'm going in without it. Okay. And, uh, and, and, I, and actually, I haven't talked to that many teams, and one of the, one of the things that uh, the race organizers have said with weather, with weather router is the problem is, is that it's dramatically different in you know, weather router for, you know, a sailing vessel mm -hmm. versus something that's rowing and you're doing two knots, you know, and, that, and you know, and you've got 24 feet and you're impacted by the wind with the, you know, um, they said that unless you actually have somebody who really knows how to weather route for a rowboat, mm -hmm. you're basically wasting your time. Makes sense. Well, also, um, you've raised a lot of money so far, correct? That is correct. Uh, so to date, we are almost at $120,000 raised for uh, Campbell Rising. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we've been very, uh, very blessed with uh, the support that we've gotten. And um, as we were saying, you know, with not only is it a great organization, but with having lost our camp for, uh, through the Berry Creek Fire, every dollar that we raise for them is, you know, invaluable. And so, yeah. So, um, and we hope we're still pushing forward on that and trying to go even bigger. <laughs> so please don't let that number deter you. <laughs> well, any other questions, folks? And Mary, Marianne does have information if everybody wants on the Kaizu up there, and you can find it. You can find it on our uh, linking through our website as well, OwensRowing.com. Well, thank you very much. This is wonderful, and uh, I will say personally, I'm going to donate. Because it's important, and uh, hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and you're covering all the expenses by yourself. The two of you are really remarkable people. You are good. Well, the world needs that. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tom. Godspeed. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.